गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन गुड इवनिंग आई वेलकम यू ऑल ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ सांगली डिस्ट्रिक्ट ऑर्थोपेडिक एसोसिएशन आई वेलकम ऑल द स्पीकर्स फॉर टुडे सी एम ई एंड ऑल द मेंबर्स ऑफ द सांगली डिस्ट्रिक्ट ऑर्थोपेडिक एसोसिएशन एज यू नो एज हैज बीन टोल्ड बाय आवर मॉडरेटर डॉक्टर राजीव ने गांधी टूडे टॉपिक इज सेप्टिक अर्थराइटिस एंड ऑस्ट्रियोमैलिटीज इन चिल्ड्रेन and as you know the causes epidemiology diagnosis and treatment of osteoarticular infections have changed considerably in recent years and today cme is going to review the most up to date literature on pediatric septic arthritis and osteomyelitis i hope at the end of today's lectures we would be having up to date knowledge of the emerging pathogens utilization of modern diagnostic techniques and implementation of newer shorter treatment regimes which can optimize the treatment of septic arthritis and osteomyelitis so i welcome you all again uh, may i take this opportunity to introduce today's speakers we have dr anil agarwal he is ms orthopedics he is specialist and head of the department of pediatric orthopedics chacha nehru bal chikitsalay delhi He is also a coordinator, and he has done one year pediatric orthopedic fellowship at CNBC. He has done over two hundred publications, and he has written twenty five book chapters. He has authored a book on pediatric osteoarticular infections. He is a trainer for Ponsetti method of club foot, and his area of interest includes pediatric infection and tuberculosis. we are also having today as a speaker dr ashish ranade who is ms ortho mrcs frcs ecf mg he has done fellowship in limb lengthening and reconstruction at baltimore usa he has done fellowship in pediatric orthopedics and scoliosis philadelphia philadelphia usa his hospital attachments are to the dinanath mangeshkar hospital pune surya mother and child care hospital at pune he is a visiting pediatric orthopedic surgeon at bharti vidyapeeth medical college hospital at pune he has done 32 publication that to in index journals of pubmed and he has written 12 book chapters and also a complete one book please welcome also dr ruta kulkani from sangli district itself who is a president of assami india and a former vice president president of assam india she is a advisor to iio elizar sub committee she is a professor of orthopedics and head of the department of pediatric orthopedics at swastiyog pratishthan miraj maharashtra she has delivered lectures on elizaro and pediatric orthopedics at various national and international platforms she has chaired numerous sessions at various national and international conferences of repute she has numerous publications in various national and international journals and conducted many workshops in elizaro and deformity correction her field of interest is deformity correction and lengthening we also welcome welcome dr chintan doshi who is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon practicing at mumbai he has done fellowship in pediatric and adolescent orthopedics at singapore he has also done a fellowship in pediatric orthopedics at us his attachments are as a consultant at rajawadi hospital also at a hiranandani hospital surya mother and child care cloud 9 hospital and shalbi hospital in mumbai he has participated in various national and international conferences he has got 12 publications to his name and he has written two book chapters we also we are also having dr nirmal raj gopinathan as a speaker today who has done ms and mnms he is a professor of pediatric orthopedic division department of orthopedics at pgi mar chandigarh his publications are 94 and out of that 64 are pubmed indexed journals he has written 20 book chapters including one in turek and one book of clinical orthopedic examination of a child 
in research she has done six patent applications to his name and pi and copi in icmr and dst dbt funded projects he is a member of editorial board international journal of pediatric orthopedics he has got many recognitions award and prizes and certificates to his name i will narrate few of them he has got jpo oa matso fellowship in 2012 he got best richer paper award in posicon 2014 he has done ao trauma asia pacific fellowship also in 2014 he has done pediatric orthopedics international observership at texas scottish right hospital for children texas us in 2016 he has done pediatric orthopedics international observership at cincinnati children's hospital and medical center cincinnati usa in 2018 he has also got a tap research committee scholarship in of a trauma asia pacific research committee in 2019 he is also visiting scholarship and invited lecturer and university he was invited as a lecturer at university of edinburgh in 2019 we also welcome dr tanu singhal who has done md pediatrics at aims new delhi she has also done msc infectious disease in london school of hygiene and tropical medicine london uk she is attached to kokila ben dhirubhai ambani hospital mumbai 2009 9 onwards since 2009 onwards she is an executive board member of fungal infections and study forum she is also an on the national expert group of rntcp on pediatric tb she has got awards in the form of dr ic verma excellence award in 2020 her interest areas are covid 19 tuberculosis antimicrobial resistance infection control travel medicine vaccinologies and biostatistics she has got 85 publications in index journal to her name she has written three books and also written 20 book chapters in various other books we also have a pediatric orthopedic surgeon from kolhapur dr raju negandi who is going to moderate today's session He has done pediatric orthopedic training at Wadia Children's Hospital in Mumbai. He has done fellowship in pediatric orthopedics at NUH Singapore. He has done fellowship in pediatric orthopedics in DKCH Hong Kong. Also has done fellowship in Stanmore UK. He has got travelling fellowship of Posna in USA. He was the organizing secretary for just concluded Posicon 2020 to Kolhapur. He has got nine publications to his name, and he has written also two book chapters. We also welcome Dr. Amit Tagare, who is MD DNB Pediatrics, DCS DNB Neonatology, and he is a neonatal fellow from Australia. He is a director and in charge of neonatologist Aditya Rainbow Super Specialty Children's Hospital, Sangli, Maharashtra. He has got fifteen publications in peer-reviewed journals. He is a co-author for Nash Neonatal Parental Nutrition Guidelines 2010. He is a faculty at national and international conferences. Currently, he holds the post of Joint Secretary Maharashtra State NNF Neonatal Foundation. I think his research interests are neonatal nutrition, non-invasive ventilations, and neonatal sepsis. so i welcome all the speakers speakers today for today's cme i welcome all the members and i hand over the mic to today's moderator moderator dr rajiv negandi who is go going to conduct the cme thank you very much nirmal can i request you just upload your token yeah thank you i thank all the organizers for having me here a very good evening to all so my topic for discussion is etiology clinical presentation and diagnosis of acute septic arthritis and osteomyelitis in children 
I have nothing to disclose and permission has been obtained to uh, use the radiographs and clinical images. So what are the learning objectives to go through uh, the clinical features, diagnosis and etiology of acute osteomyelitis and septic arthritis? Uh, although we are discussing these as separate entities, we should know that they both can coexist at some of the times and uh, it happens in approximately 30 to 33 percent of cases and it is very high in neonates up to 76 percent. It is very important to have this in mind so that we don't miss few of these cases which might have bad prognosis if we miss them. So here in this radiograph, you are able to see that there is a, a rarefaction and changes in the proximal humerus that is a proximal humeral osteomyelitis along with the shoulder septic arthritis. So this, these conditions need to be picked up. So what are the reasons for this to happen? So one thing is the neonates and children up to 18 months or up to 24 months of age, the vascularity is shared between the metaphysis and the epiphysis. There is a transphysial vasculature that is patent. So this infection can spread to epiphysis in these smaller kids. But once the secondary ossification center appears and the growth plate appears, the blood supply is varied and this doesn't happen frequently. The other reason is few of the metaphyses of the bones shown here are intra-articular like the proximal radius, the proximal humerus and femur and the distal tibia and the infection in these metaphysal areas in the form of osteomyelitis can spill into the joint and can result in a septic arthritis. So uh, it is very important to have this in mind. So in neonates it is up to 76 percent that these two can coexist. So the topic itself is pretty exhaustive and I'm going to just discuss 10 relevant points on osteomyelitis and septic arthritis. So first thing is about the clinical futures of osteomyelitis and septic arthritis. I'm going to deal them both together and I'm going to add upon few points which uh, should differentiate both of them. So the cornerstone for uh, diagnosing and managing these conditions is the clinical acumenid examination. So this clinical examination is supplemented by laboratory and radiological investigations. So the main thing is the clinical diagnosis and clinical findings. So the laboratory and radiology are just going to supplement whatever you have diagnosed using your clinical equipment. And uh, one important thing is when you are examining a neonate, a neonate may not present in the way an older child presents with these musculoskeletal infections. So here is a, this is not a neonate, it's an infant of three to four months of age. But here the child didn't present with fever. The mother complained that the child is not taking feeds and the child cries when she tries to change the shirt of the child actually or when she tries to move the right upper lip. You can see that there is a swelling, there is a little bit of erythema and you can see the amount of changes that is happening in the bone deep down. So these uh, neonates, so you have to have a very high index of clinical suspicion because it may they may be misleading and uh, the findings may be subtle like the child crying on changing diaper, diapers if the lower limb is involved or crying on passive movements of the upper limb when you are trying to change the clothes etc. Fever which is uh, commonly seen in an older child is not often present in a neonate and uh, the child may be irritable and refuse feeds and a pseudo paralysis that is the child may not move the upper limb uh, involved uh, extremity or the upper or lower limb when there is a, a underlying disorder. Older child, you may have the classical findings like excruciating pain, tenderness, swelling, erythema, difficulty in weight bearing, fever, and child refusing examination or movement of the extremity. So uh, it's very important to find out these things. And uh, you should also know the predisposing factors in neonates and young children, which can uh, lead to osteomyelitis. For example, prematurity, uh, history of umbilical catheterization, or other disorders of the urinary tract or skin and ear infections or a respiratory tract infection, you have to be vigilant in your history taking so that you don't miss these conditions which can predispose. Uh, regarding the septic arthritis, the clinical futures, again, a neonate may present with subtle findings and you have to be vigilant in picking up these findings. One important thing is hypothermia may be seen instead of fever. And uh, unlike older children, Older children only, uh, it's many a times it's monoarticular, but in a neonate, it may be multiple joints which are involved simultaneously in septic arthritis. The other findings are the same in both the conditions. Uh, once you have a doubt of uh, an osteomyelitis or a septic arthritis, what are you going to do? So the reflexly we order the uh, acute phase reactants, namely we uh, the blood cell count, the total count, differential count the CRP, ESR, and some of them are using procalcitonin. So uh, the WBC may not be elevated at all that point of time. 
So the two most important things which we use in our day-to-day -day practices, CRP and ESR, which of them is more suitable? So CRP, the CRP has, although it is non-specific acute phase reactant, and but it is used to supplement your diagnosis and to monitor the clinical prognosis or the progress of the disorder uh, of the infection. So what is the advantage of CRP over ESR? CRP has a shorter half-life and once there is an infection, it peaks to the value, highest value in 48 hours. And also when appropriate therapy is instituted, it starts falling down and reaches normal value by 7 to 10 days. So it having a shorter half-life, it is very pertinent to be used as a monitoring uh, uh, lab acute phase reactant. On the other hand, ESR, it takes around five days for peaking and it takes around three to six weeks to settle down. So CRP is the one that is commonly used as a supplement for your clinical evaluation. Regarding procalcitonin, research has found the, there are no uh, satisfactory evidence that uh, procalcitonin is, has outperformed CRP as an acute phase reactant and hence it is not routinely uh, like uh, prescribed as a monitoring uh, lab reactant. Third thing, whenever we have a doubt of septic arthritis, we are going to tap or whenever we have an osteomyelitis with a reactive effusion or a, a effusion which may be reactive or a septic arthritis, we are going to tap the joint. This is going to be very handy and helps us in diagnosing these disorders. A synovial fluid should be tapped and if it is a deep joint, joint, you can use a ultrasonography to tap the joint and it has to be sent for cell count, gram stain, culture and antibiotic sensitivity if growth occurs. So the typical features in septic arthritis are a cloudy or purulent synovial fluid. The WBC count more than 50,000 cells per ml with more than 90% of them being polymorphonuclear neutrophils. Apart from them, the glucose level and protein level are also being used. But the first two things are more important. A glucose level 50 milligram percent less than serum glucose level also suggests septic arthritis. The fourth thing is culture. So culture, it can be either a blood culture or it can be the material. It can be from the periosteum, from the bone tissue or the pus. So blood cultures are positive in approximately 30 to 50 percent of cases with acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. And remember, blood culture can be positive even in neonates with afibrile presentation. So, so it is mandatory to send up for a blood culture if you suspect a musculoskeletal infection. Tissue culture, uh, the notable proportion of cases that is between 20 to 50, 55 percent are culture negative. But you can uh, enhance the yield if the aspirates are obtained from affected metaphyseal region, preferably under uh, image guidance. But uh, you can see that none of them is 100% positive here. So again, these are going to supplement your clinical valuation. Few points regarding culture. Anaerobic blood culture is obtained prior to antibiotic administration. So uh, if, if it is possible, it is applied to the antibiotic administration. But it is not the same for tissue culture. You can take a culture even after administration of antibiotics up to 72 hours. And in case of special scenarios, like if you are suspecting Kingella, that is a child between six months to four years of age, you have to directly inoculate the specimen into blood or chocolate. These are some uh, special situations. And uh, regarding the radiography, the radiography is not particularly helpful in early diagnosis or early in the early stages of osteomyelitis because they may, you may not be able to pick up just um, few uh, like futures like soft tissue changes may be seen as early as 48 hours, but uh, it's not routinely appreciable. The bone involvement is delayed and becomes obvious after 7 to 21 days. So here is a case uh, as a case of uh, septic arthritis ankle along with the distal tibial osteomyelitis based on clinical examination. The child underwent debridement twice, but still had persistent discharge. So when we took a radiograph to see what's happening, you can see that there is changes or rarefaction and sclerosis in the calcaneum that is happening. So this child had a calcaneal osteomyelitis, which presented like a septic arthritis of the ankle joint. So x-rays do have a role. They should not be missed. And uh, apart from these things, they are helpful to rule out other differentials like a trauma, like a tumor, etc. So x-rays are, are uh, definitely a handy tool while evaluating these kids is the common investigation that is being done if you are suspecting an effusion and it can also identify periosteal elevation, cortical erosion or subperiosteal fluid collection. Remember it is user dependent 
and uh, it cannot evaluate bone marrow lesions. This is a diagnosis of early osteomyelitis. A fluid collection when seen in direct contact with bone is highly suggestive of osteomyelitis and it can also help us to uh, guide us to, uh, to select appropriate site to choose for aspirations. MRI. So this is the same kid about which I was talking who had the calcaneal osteomyelitis and you can see the amount of changes that is happening here which is what's not appreciated earlier. So MRI is becoming the imaging modality of choice for investigating osteomyelitis and uh, in a suspicion of a septic arthritis with costumulus. In addition to identifying its site, it is also useful in defining soft tissue involvement, delineating bone and soft tissue abscesses, and shows coexisting joint pathology. Uh, the cost and the need for sedation is always a concern, and also it may not be reliably differentiating osteomyelitis from medullary infarction and metabolic disorders. But still, MI is the imaging modality of choice in these two disorders. So we have few differentials for osteomyelitis. It may be cellulitis, it can be a, a trauma, uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, malignancies and bone infarction and septic arthritis, the number one differential is the transient and viral reactive as shown here. So the diagnostic criteria, uh, there has been few diagnostic criteria which has been given for osteomyelitis like by Wild et al. They use four culture, abnormal imaging and clinical findings. So if you see all of these uh, things uh, revolve around your clinical examination and its supplementation by the lab investigations or the imaging investigations. For uh, septic arthritis to dif differentiate from it from uh, transient synovitis, we have the coaches criteria which has fever more than 38.5 degrees Celsius, the refusal and 12,000 and then even three of them were positive and 99 when all the four were positive. And later on, CRP was also added as an independent risk factor to uh, facilitate uh, a more accurate diagnosis of uh, these two disorders or differentiating both of them. So etiology, I will just uh, touch upon few things. So if you have uh, uh, suspecting a nosocomial or a community acquired infection, you have to be vigilant for gram negative uh, uh, pathogens also. And uh, children less than four years, the emerging infection is a Kingella infection for which you have, uh, you may not have other lab parameters that are positive, like a CRP may be negative in a Kingella infection. So you have to go for advanced nucleic acid amplification methods or extended culture to diagnose these conditions. And also infants, you have to think about streptococcus. And, uh, but the Staphylococcus aureus is the commonest organism across all the age groups for both these disorders. And uh, few other things like varicella lesions are super infected with group A streptococcus, and the pseudomonas originis osteomyelitis may be seen in foot puncture wounds, etc. So, uh, like few etiologies which have you have to keep in mind. So, my references, two papers from Dr. Anil Agarwal. This is from OCNA, which talks about uh, hematogenous osteomyelitis and septic arthritis. And this one, from the 2021 Chest Disease Society. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Nirmal, for the excellent talk. Uh, any questions? So please uh, stop sharing your screen. Any questions yeah, from the faculty or delegates? Nirmal, can I just ask you one question? How? What are the cases where you prefer ultrasound over MRI? Nirmal, are you able it's an easy available investigation. So we do ultrasound. I'm audible now. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. I'm audible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the main concern with the MRI is the need for sedation. Or even in our institute, uh, getting an MRI in emergency is a bit difficult actually. But ultrasound is like easily available everywhere. So ultrasound is uh, and radiography. They both are uh, the immediate investigations which we do. And in cases which are like not responding to your therapy more than 48 hours or you have other uh, doubts, we go for MR investigation actually, MRI. So ultrasound we do uh, commonly for all, all the cases of septic arthritis and osteomyelitis which we come across actually. Recently I had one Does that child. answer your question, Rajiv? Yeah, yeah. 
recently just recently i mean like two days back only i had one child who was diagnosed absolutely normal on ultrasound but the clinical suspicion was so high that i decided to do mri and uh, it picked up uh, uh, the lesion and, uh, and then we could drain it so i think uh, we have to judge uh, upon the clinical scenarios and then go ahead yeah exactly the clinical evaluation is the cornerstone actually these are supplements so definitely you are right uh, good evening nirmal it was nice presentation i am a neonatologist i am just asking you one question um when uh, you have a clinical suspicion and all the sepsis screens and blood investigations come normal and your mri is borderline how do you proceed uh yeah so uh, the next thing here is apart from uh, uh, evaluation by us this these disorders are managed with a, a multidisciplinary team so we do uh, also consult an infectious disease specialist here who we have here to uh, to rule out other uh, pathologies which may be uh, like uh, mimicking an osteomyelitis or a septic arthritis so what we do is a multidisciplinary meeting actually first of all and then we uh, proceed accordingly uh, does does that why, answer or like uh, why i asked you the question long back i had a patient uh, she was 7 days old who had left hemi uh, left paresis upper limb paresis and that time uh, we did her uh, sepsis screen which came back bang normal the mri was done which was the borderline and the radiologist was feeling that it is this quite early phase so we need to treat and so we sent the cultures and everything the antibiotics were started cultures came back normal the sepsis screen remained normal and the baby clinically improved in matter of 3 4 days now the issue was are we really treating osteomyelitis or not because 6 weeks of antibiotics is pretty big thing for the relatives also so in such a scenario where you are in the gray zone and your imaging is not also uh, helping clinically you have strong suspicion because she had hemi she had the paresis of the upper limb and it was suspicion of a uh, uh, humeral uh, osteomyelitis so in such scenario uh, what will be your take yeah yeah we so so uh, so many times we do this patient who are picked up at the time of edema test in or actually but as you say the child has improved after your operation it may be an early osteomyelitis still proceed with the completion of the dose actually and i will treat as an osteomyelitis because we are seeing a clinical improvement with the uh, with our the diagnosis which you made actually so i will stick on to it i will complete the antibiotic course completely thank you nirmal i think we'll move on thank to you. the next talk uh, which is on medical management of um, acute septic arthritis and osteomyelitis we as a surgeons are very poor probably in treating the medical part of uh, uh, the disease and we have a expert today dr tanu singhal from uh, ambani hospital uh, over to you madam please share your screen so can you see my screen yes we can yes yeah. so uh, good evening everybody and thank you so much to talk about uh, medical management of bone and joint infections and dr alvi kalmi actually used to work a lot in management of these infections and thanks to him for suggesting my name here so um i think my talk will basically be on the treatment to the antibiotics but you must understand it's a multidisciplinary effort where you need both the orthopedic surgeon and the pediatric neonatologist or the infectious disease specialist managing these patients so the first question in our mind is that once we have actually made a clinical diagnosis or uh, of osteomyelitis or septic arthritis what empiric therapy should we start assuming that we have sent all the tests and we have sent whatever investigations including cultures so we can talk about it in terms of uh, children who are aged 5 years and older and we have already heard that staph aureus is major cause and in that also it's methicillin sensitive staph aureus so the empiric therapy is either giving clopsicillin flu clopsicillin or cefazolin now these drugs were not easily available a few years earlier but now there are some companies who are manufacturing them like clops is manufactured by jolly healthcare 
at a do at a cost of forty rupees per gram. You have flu clocks in the way um, as Staphonex, which is quite expensive, though it's available. And Cefazolin has no staff, which is again very reasonable price. You can order for these drugs. And between clocks and cefazolin, uh, clocks is actually the gold standard. But the problems with cefazolin is it is it has to be given six hourly, and uh, they can be thromboflebitis. So, uh, more and you have uh, unless you have a lot of pus, um, you you actually choose cefazolin. Like we commonly use cefazolin, it is cheaper and it can be given eight hourly versus six hourly for clocks. Now sometimes if none of these drugs are available. You could choose either cefuroxime or ceftriaxone. Uh, of course, if this anemia, if there is staph or this bacteria, then uh, cefuroxime and uh, ceftriaxone are not good choices. The next question in mind is that are we to cover for MRI right in the beginning? Now, it's generally recommended from Western textbooks that if your MRSC prevalence is more than ten to twenty percent, you should add a cover for MRSC. In, there are not Indian studies here, but some of the Indian studies suggest an MRSA prevalence of about 50%. MRSA, where they routinely add an MRSA cover, and there are others where they don't add. So, some of the recommendations to add an anti MRSA cover are if the child is very small, the abscess, fractures, deep vein thrombosis, multifocal involvement. These may some and uh, or if you have a white cell count which is low, which could indicate that it's a PVL producing MRSA, you may add an empiric cover. And this can be either with vancomycin or ecoplanin. Clindamycin is not recommended because many of these staph aureus in our country are not sensitive to clindamycin unless you get the susceptibility. You should not use it empirically. And neither is linezolid recommended for empiric therapy in a sick patient because it's a bacteriostatic drug. And it may not be a good drug if there is associated bacteremia as many of these patients have. There is also another study which showed that if you delay the ad addition of anti-MRSA drug, it does not affect outcome. So people may actually, in a non-sick patient, just give cefazolin or cloxacillin and wait till the cultures come back. Because many times, if your cultures are negative and you have started both the drugs for MSSA and MRSA, then you may have to continue both the drugs till six weeks. And you know you don't know what to do. You can't take off one of the drugs because you don't know what drug helped the patient. So that is a limitation of starting an MRSA cover upfront. Now, what about children between? three months to five years here as we knew know for earlier that apart from staph aureus you have kingella pneumococcus and hip also therefore the first drugs of first choice here are cefazolin or cefuroxime cefuroxime is preferred because it covers hip also unlike cefazolin it does not cover hip cloxacillin is not recommended as the drug of first choice it does not cover the other pathogens like kingella pneumococcus and hip Again, in this age also, you would add an anti-MRSA therapy if the risk factors for MRSA are present. And remember, this is we are talking about empiric therapy before we have our culture results. Now, neonates are completely different. Here, it is really important to get your cultures before initiating antibiotics because the etiology is very varied. It can be very uh, multi-drug resistant or XDR gram-negative pathogens. It can be MRSA. It can be candida. Fungal osteomyelitis is also very common. And sometimes what you can also do is that look at the NICU cultures of this baby because many babies have newborn sepsis, they have bacteremia, they are treated and then they come back with osteomyelitis or septic arthritis and usually it is the same pathogen which caused the newborn sepsis. So you can look at that. And if you have a sick patient, before you get your reports back, you can start them on empiric therapy with a broad spectrum agent like either carbapenem or BLBLI combination like Piptaz, uh, etc. with aminoglycoside and vancomycin. So the treatment of neonatal um, osteomyelitis and septic arthritis is quite different. Now, what to do once your cultures are positive? Because as we heard, cultures may be positive 50 to 50% 50 of the times. Either it is a blood culture which is positive or a joint fluid culture or a tissue culture. Now, your therapy initial has to be IV only. And these choices are based on what the pathogen is, what is the susceptibility, what is the availability, cost, bone penetration, and also whether there is coexistent bacteremia or not. So if you have MSSA, then again, your drugs of choice are cefazolin or cloxacillin. But if you have MRSA, 
you can use ticoplanin now ticoplanin is preferred over vancomycin for treatment of mrsa because of many reasons one because it has better bone penetration than vancomycin it is easier to give because it is once a day therapy and it can be continued on an outpatient basis it has less nephrotoxicity and infusion uh, site reactions so uh, you can choose ticoplanin here uh, and the maximal recommended doses should be used and i'll come to the doses a little later but the common question in the minds of people is that what if your cultures are negative so if your cultures are negative then you have to guess that the organism is most likely to be staph aureus and here you would um, uh, give either cefazolin or cloxacillin as empiric therapy or oh, sorry as definitive therapy now the next question is that when can we switch from parenteral to oral so this decision of oral should be individualized for every patient so there is no real guideline as such so the first factor depends on whether the patient has bacteremia means if the blood cultures are positive and if it is staph aureus then it is generally recommended that you must give two weeks of therapy and you must repeat the blood culture um uh, after two to three days to make sure that the culture has become negative however if there is no bacteremia then you can give it you can switch from iv to oral after 5 to 7 days based on the clinical response based on the crp because the crp is a good method to track the infection and once your crp is down to 30 to 50% of the original level and the patient's a febrile the pain is less and you have no complications you can switch to oral in fact there are studies which have shown that early switch over to oral therapy is not Uh, associated with inferior outcomes as compared to uh, prolonged parenteral therapy and in fact prolonged parenteral therapy may have uh, more harms than benefits because many of these patients lack of thrombophlebitis they have central central line related infections etc and once you switch to oral therapy again the choice depends on the organism so if it is mssa you use either ceflexin or clindamycin based on the susceptibility and the dose of ceflexin is quite high about 100 mg per kg per day and if it is mrsa then we should not always use linezolid because linezolid is quite a toxic drug and if you give prolonged therapy you may have side effects so if your isolate is ceftriaxacin you can also use these drugs as oral treatment because they have good bone penetration and they have fewer side effects what about duration of therapy so as the decision of oral switch over is um, also um, uh, kind of individualized the duration of therapy is also individualized but broadly speaking for uncomplicated osteomyelitis your 3 to 4 weeks therapy is non inferior to 6 weeks therapy however if there are complications if there is a delayed clinical response or if you have pelvic spine infections then your treatment is for 6 weeks if you have a patient who has come with subacute to chronic osteomyelitis then treatment may have to extend for up to 12 weeks in mrsa osteomyelitis you may need longer therapy for up to 8 weeks and for example in candida osteomyelitis in neonates your treatment has to be for 6 months similarly in osteo in septic arthritis the duration of therapy is actually shorter it is 2 to 3 weeks but as was said earlier many times your septic arthritis can be associated with osteomyelitis so if there is associated osteomyelitis your treatment has to be longer so either you can do an mri or you can actually do a plain x ray after 2 to 3 weeks of treatment and if your x ray shows changes in the bone you know that there is osteomyelitis and you have to prolong therapy maybe by a week or more and this is just to tell you again for because the mssa and mrsa are our commonest organisms it's clocks or cefazolin as the first line therapy see the doses carefully because you have to use good doses otherwise you will have failure of therapy and you will have progression to chronic osteomyelitis and uh, similarly the dosage of ceflexin is high similarly for ticoplanin again your dose is not the usual 400 bd for three uh, you know which you uh, 400 only the dose of ticoplanin is higher for osteomyelitis where it is 12 mg per kg per day given 12 hourly um, for three doses and then 12 mg per kg per day um, uh, you know and the maximum dose is 800 mg similarly the dose of vancomycin is also quite high so please remember that in bone and joint infections you have to use higher doses than what is given routinely and some of the agents which are used commonly should not be actually used for example carbapenems unless you have a newborn 
there's no point in using a carbapenem again bl bli combinations no role unless it's a new bond uh, or similarly amino glycosides adding amino glycosides to cloxacillin cefazolin is of no benefit in treatment of staph aureus and in fact it increases toxicity so they should not be used so that is uh, how i would like to conclude that please send appropriate cultures before starting antibiotics choose your empiric therapy wisely in below 5 years you can choose either cefazolin or cefiroxin and 5 years and above your choice is clox or cefazolin and you can actually get access to these drugs because their companies marketing them and they are quite reasonably priced decide carefully whether to give empiric therapy for mrsa because if you start using it in patients uh, you may actually if the culture is negative you may have to use it for 6 weeks and remember our commonest agent is mrsa and if you use anti mrsa drugs like ticoplanin or vancomycin for treatment of mrsa it is inferior than cefazolin or cefiroxin so you can't start vancomycin or ticoplanin empirically for these patients change therapy after obtaining the reports of the cultures Uh, if required, change from parenteral to oral on an individualized basis. Choose oral therapy again wisely. Use high doses which can penetrate the bone, and use drugs which have good oral bioavailability. And then finally, the duration of therapy also. You should neither give too short so that you get a relapse or you get progression to chronic osteoporosis. You should give too long so that you have toxicity. I think with that, I would like to stop my presentation and I hand it over to the moderator. thank you thank you madam yeah i think this question has been answered dr ankit jain asked please explain the iv and oral antibiotic duration so i guess this is been answered uh, i would like to just ask one question is uh, there any role of putting uh, uh, antibiotic powder at the local site of uh, uh, surgery so that is not indicated unless you really have a prosthesis at that point because you know for example if you are doing a debridement and retention of a prosthesis then definitely you have worried about biofilms and therefore you would uh, use local you know either stimulan beads or you would use antibiotic impregnated cement but for native osteomyelitis or septic arthritis there is really no role of putting a local antimicrobial at that site Uh, my routine practice is that i have been putting local uh, vancomycin powder just powder uh, no beads nothing and uh, i don't know whether this is really helping it but uh, just a question yeah. so no it is not routinely recommended i mean because most of your patients will have no um, kind of um, implant or anything there and um, usually the vascularity is pretty good because these are all metaphyseal infection so there is good blood supply as well so maybe there could be a role in chronic osteomyelitis where you have you know removed the sequestrum and you've done a sequestrectomy but not for acute osteomyelitis uh, another question i just wanted to ask is there any different uh, medical management for a hospital acquired or a surgical acquired infection yes because there these whatever i said today is about like community acquired osteomyelitis now when you have a hospital acquired osteomyelitis you know that you are dealing with more resistant pathogens so in that situation one is that you have to obtain a local culture because you know what we say in community acquired osteomyelitis you send bone culture blood cultures and you don't really send bone cultures or tissue cultures unless it is easily accessible because you know that it will be staff aureus most of the time but if it is a hospital acquired infection you have to make an extra effort to try and get a local sample because you have to treat these patients for 6 weeks and unless you do know what organism it is you will not be able to you know give treatment for 6 weeks so one thing is that you choose uh, you immediately get a sample from the local area by ultrasound guided aspiration or whatever and then you start empiric therapy based on what is the epidemiology in the hospital of the surgical site infections now most of the uh, most of these cases are due to gram negative like in our setting so most of them will be you know uh, resistant to the ceftriaxone and other so you will have to use drugs like piprocillin tazobactam or meropenem 
with or without amikacin as your empiric therapy. And then sometimes in the end, you may find that even carbapenems are resistant. And once you get your cultures, you may have to use polymyxin B and other pathogens. So that is the completely you know, different approach to treatment in hospital-acquired infections. These drugs, what I mentioned here, will not really work here. There is a question in child less than one month, can we give oral antibiotic or IV is the rule? I think for neonates, you have to give intravenous antibiotics because most of the times, uh, you know, you have a pathogen for which you don't have an oral switch over available. So you have to, you're, unless you're lucky and then, you know, after two, three weeks, you have an oral drug. Most of them are due MDR with the exception that if you have candida osteomyelitis, then you initially give intravenous and then you can switch to oral. But in neonates, we generally prefer to give parenteral therapy for the whole duration. Uh, just a last question. Uh, what are the red flag cases where you would like to do fungal cultures? I mean, whenever we are working with the limited resources and obtaining fungal culture is also sometimes difficult. So which cases would you suspect that? So I would suspect fungal infections in neonates in immunocompromised patients and in hospital acquired osteomyelitis. Now, blood fungal culture, blood cultures, you don't need to separate, send it separately in a fungal medium because candida grows very well in our normal aerobic cultures. Okay. So you don't need to send separate blood fungal cultures. Yes, but tissue cultures, if you are taking, then for these patients, you should ask for fungal culture also. KOH mountain fungal culture for hospital acquired infections, newborns and um, immunocompromised hosts. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we'll just move on to the next mm -hmm. lecture by uh, Chintan Doshi on surgical treatment of septic arthritis and, and uh, acute osteomyelitis. Chintan, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Chintan Doshi. I'm here to discuss on the uh, surgical treatment of septic arthritis and acute osteomyelitis. As we discussed on management of acute osteomyelitis uh, uh, by uh, medical management by Dr. Tanu Singhal, and she has very well explained us this. So the surgical management will be covered by me. And then uh, after all this management, we have to monitor the patient uh, for complete recovery and manage post septic sequelae as well. So the surgical management usually involves uh, decompression of the joint, which is release of the tamponade of the collection, which is there. Then debridement of the, all the infective and the inflammatory uh, toxins and debris. And then sterilization of the joint by giving a thorough wash. So the first two parts are usually the ones which are the uh, surgical methods, uh, the decompression and the debridement. And then the sterilization is... Uh, by ongoing antimicrobial therapy, as what uh, Dr. Santano Singhal Ma'am has explained us uh, in a wonderful lecture. So, surgical method of uh, treating septic arthritis is by uh, very most much, much thorough debridement as we open. Yeah, can yeah. you hear me now? Yes, I just got unmuted. Yes, okay. So, yeah. uh, so as I as I was already speaking. Uh, so there is needle aspiration, arthrotomy, and arthroscopy. I think uh, you followed me till here, right? Yeah, Chintan, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, what do we follow usually is uh, we do the complete job at the first instance, clear the clear the infection and the toxins, and also after that, it is very important to give a thorough wash. So, what I usually follow is I always uh, get reminded of this: solution to pollution is dilution. So always give a wash and try to remove all the debris, all the infection which is there, uh, probably in the joint or in the bone. And I follow this for both septic arthritis and osteomyelitis. So going into individual techniques, uh, aspiration uh, is usually important for early diagnosis and it can be done in an emergency basis on arrival. It can be done uh, with USG guided aspiration if you have a good radiologist and uh, repeat aspirations, however, may be necessary. So the pros and cons for aspiration are, uh, it gives us a quick, quick procedure for emergency. It gives us a sample for getting a culture. However, it is less satisfactory drainage and uh, might need multiple tricks for the same. So this is one of the procedure which I had done for septic arthritis in an older child. Uh, I had first put a needle from the sub uh, adductor approach and uh, tried to get uh, the sample. So that, that is on the left hand side, the sample that we got. 
and then uh, with the same thing as the infection was just located inside the uh, hip and there was no other uh, focus uh, what i did was i took a anterior portal with another syringe with 18 gauge needle put in the uh, wash saline and then try to aspirate from the medial side so there was a clear fluid uh, after 5 to 6 syringes wash and uh, probably i repeated for another few times and then once the uh, once it was clear that there was nothing else but the just the clear saline which was coming out of the medial syringe was when i thought that uh, we will stop here however i had, uh, we had also explained the parents that he may require a open procedure however after doing a sonography after this procedure there was no other accumulation anywhere and the child had completely recovered and this is post uh, 10 days post iv uh, post antibiotics so is uh, uh, again the iv antibiotic is still going on but the child has a uh, markedly uh, good clinical recovery now this is one of the ways uh, which we can do however it is recommended that a arthrotomy would have been done but then as he improved we couldn't we didn't require another uh, procedure for this kid coming to the most gal standard method which is arthrotomy open the joint so we decompress the joint completely remove all the debris the infection the toxins send the culture for send the samples for the culture and uh, give a thorough wash again solution to pollution is dilution so give thorough wash so such that the returning fluid from the joint is a clear saline and no other debris from the joint arthroscopy is another technique which which uh, we, uh, is a known technique there are papers which are published however in arthroscopy there are blind spots uh, and there can be infection which can be uh, you know uh, hidden there and we may not be able to do a thorough debridement uh, also for young kids uh, younger than 8 uh, 7 to 8 years we require special arthroscopy instruments most of the time we also use uh, ankle arthroscopy guides uh, for these the normal knee or the hip guides may not work in a small kid like this so for any suspicion as we already heard from the previous speakers uh we remember the caucus criteria unable to wet bear fever, fever more, more than 38.5 degree celsius wbc count more than 12000 and esr raised esr and c yeah chintan just log out from the one uh, device if you are using two no. devices no so uh, i'm using two devices because the one device cannot sh share screen and uh, the other one i'm uh, using to share screen and i'm talking from the phone right yeah now. yeah the, okay go ahead go ahead so that is the thing okay so uh, so for any suspicion have a, a low threshold for surgery uh, if there is any clinical uh, signs of infection for a uh, uh, surgical management of acute osteomyelitis is the same open debridement is gold standard for uh, osteomyelitis which has intra uh, medullary abscess or intermedullary collection we make drill holes and make a window and remove all the infected material again a thorough debridement is what is needed in addition to this uh, thorough debridement we use antibiotic mix stimulan at times when the infection is very severe we use fixators if there is a pathological fracture or we suspect that it's going to uh, cause a pathological fracture in cases where there is already if a sinus or a discharging pus a soft tissue coverage procedure may be required at a later date once the sinuses and everything has healed uh, and if there is a open wound so this is one case of 10 year old boy with pain and uh, pain and swelling in the legs in 7 days following a trivial trauma he was treated as a sprain at other hospital he came to me with fever since 4 days irritable inability to wait bear and that was when we did the mri and it showed us a gross collection around the tibia the entire tibia from the proximal uh, metaphysis to the distal metaphysis shows collection and there is intermedullary abscess which is also present uh, in this uh, in this case so what was done was as soon as we incised as soon as there was a nick we could see all the subcutaneous and the subperiosteal abscess which was collecting had just uh, got its way out and it was completely getting uh, drained with just a single nick however we did a thorough debridement and then uh, the entire um, pus the entire amount of pus was uh, removed from the uh, subcutaneous and subperiosteal region and then a window was made in the intramedullary region with a curette with a small curette in the proximal metaphysis as well as in the distal metaphysis a thorough debridement was done so to clear the 
uh, intermediary region what i do is i use a infant feeding tube all the way from the proximal metaphyses to the distal metaphyses and then give a wash so that the wash spreads all over inside and the wash which is sent from the proximal side should discharge as a clear fluid from the distal end so this is what we obtained so always another mantra that we all remember and even uh, for any tumor or any infection biopsy all that you culture and culture whatever you biopsy so this has to be done so a biopsy sample has been collected in formalin to confirm that it is osteomyelitis some i have seen during my residency days uh, having sarcoma being treated as a osteomyelitis because the presentation is very much similar but uh, the biopsy will pick it up so a biopsy is always always mandatory uh, to do in all cases of septic arthritis or uh, osteomyelitis whenever it is possible to get a tissue so this is a post operative uh, x ray this is a immediate post op when the stimulon beads were put inside and uh, the two months post op where the where we see a complete resolution and there is no other uh, signs of infection for this case post surgical management again uh, uh, further sterilization is by uh, continuing uh, empirical or uh, culture sensitive antibiotics monitoring clinical response monitoring crp and giving iv iv antibiotics till crp is negative and then convert to oral so take home messages are surgical management is decompression and thorough debridement in both septic arthritis and osteomyelitis give good wash give good clearance from both the tissues uh, so solution to pollution is dilution low threshold for surgical procedure whenever in doubt it is always uh, better that you open uh, for the antibiotic therapy and monitor closely for response thank you hello Uh, Hi, thank you thank you dr chintan for an excellent presentation i have uh, two questions uh, yes, in septic arthritis of the hip when you uh, recommend to do drill holes or make window in the metaphyses do you recommend it to uh, every time or when when do you recommend and my second yeah. question is after septic draining septic arthritis of the hip do you uh, recommend any uh, spica or pauli harness what is your recommendation yes so uh, for the drilling of the metaphyses and septic arthritis uh, i would do if there is a suspicion so one is i try, try to get mri done whenever it is possible sometimes because of the patient's uh, financial condition and the location it may not be possible but if i see any edema or any periosteal reaction or anything i would definitely do a drilling of the metaphyses in such a case however uh, if it is a short presentation less than 2 days and if it is not uh, very severe and i uh, suspect it is going only going to be in the hip i would avoid doing a drilling for the metaphyses i would not do it for all the cases but i would do it if it if there is a suspicion long presentation more than 3 or 4 days uh, mri or ultrasound showing any periosteal reaction or any edema around the metaphyseal area another the second question being uh, whether uh, we give, give any immobilizer after uh, giving uh, after doing the drainage yes for a neonate i would use a pauli harness most commonly it controls the pain and it also helps in uh, securing my uh, fear of getting a uh, post septic sequelae in terms of getting uh, dislocation or if the capsule is loose getting any sort of post septic sequelae so yes 3 to 6 weeks of uh, uh, pauli harness in a neonate for a older child between 2 to 5 years i would give a spica and uh, older than that uh, probably if the spica is not comfortable then uh, it would be a long leg knee brace with a abduction uh, pillow in between it would be my recommendation for at least 3 weeks hello i have got one question for you i am dr deshpande yes. from sangli Uh, i wanted to know you have kept uh, some stimulon beads in one of the x rays so which antibiotic do you prefer in those stimulon beads yes sir so uh, it is uh, heat stable Empirical. antibiotic yes sir so uh, they, they, those are heat stable antibiotics the most commonly as uh, in the previous uh, case uh, uh, dr rajiv had suggested we use vancomycin it is heat stable and 
gentamicin a mixture can be used both of these are uh, heat stable antibiotics heat level antibiotics like uh, cephalosporins usually won't work because they will get deactivated the proteinous nature will get deactivated when the heat from the stimulant is uh, generated but so you usually, said na that stimulant beads can be mixed with even heat labile antibiotics uh yes because sir, they are these are calcium sulfate beads no yes sir Uh -huh. so when the setting yes sir so when the setting is hap uh, happening uh, by the protocol i usually use uh, vancomycin and okay. uh, gentamicin okay okay any questions from the audience good evening sir in the case of uh, osteomyelitis is it a rule to always uh, fix it to prevent the pathological fracture uh not always the rule uh, so uh, for this case i did not use anything i just use a slab and a cast after uh, the wound has healed after uh, two weeks after removing the stitches so uh, i would use if there is a already a cortical break which is there because of the uh, uh, escape of the uh, uh, infective material from the bone into the subcutaneous tissue or into the periosteum So if there is already a bony breach, which means the bone is already soft, and it would lead to a septic, uh, it will lead to a pathological fracture. So if there is already a fracture, then yes, but not always. So I, I, we can use a slab or a plaster to immobilize it, anyways. And the option we have is only the external fixator. Uh, external fixator is preferred because uh, we don't want to put any any uh, metallic implants internally, so as to not. Uh, allow the infection another foreign body to cause uh, it to spread but yes if it is a pathological fracture which is already present to me i would use a, a external fixator and if it is only one cortex breach not more than uh, two cortex size two cortices breach then i would just use a slab not even a external fixator thank you uh ha dr chintan there are two yes, questions sir. in the chat box first is uh, for uh, to collect pus for culture sensitivity which approach you prefer medial approach or direct lateral approach is the first question and second is do you recommend the use of stimulant in acute osteomyelitis uh, so uh, for the hip right uh, getting the approach from the hip so for uh, if i'm doing a aspiration then yes from the medial side usually we use a subadductor approach even for doing arthrogram and everything so it is a direct approach to the joint capsule so we use a medial approach for aspiration but if i'm to open i will use a standard smith peterson approach go anteriorly open the joint and then uh, debridge it so that is for the first question the second question stimula no not always as in this case i had already trained about 40 to 50 ml of pus i was expecting it to be mrsa it turned out to be mrsa definitely but uh, uh, if i suspect that uh, something of this is needed then yes i will use it a uh, gross infection entire diaphys is involved i don't want to go another i don't want to go in another time if don't want a chance of infection to you know flourish again so yes i i used it in this case not always if it is a localized small area i would not use stimulant uh excuse me do you advise post operative mri to see to that it has completely debrided inside so post operative uh, is usually by clinical response uh post operative mri i would not do for a case which is straight forward we have had cases uh, when i was working in wadia where we debrided once after 7 days there was another episode of fever there was another uh, collection so we had to do a repeat mri to see now where the collection was but not as a routine so if there is something which is going to collect again it is not at the same location it is in the neighboring joint then yes i would repeat a mri but if it's straight forward patient resolving improving with antibiotics clinically better uh, mo movements are good then i would not repeat a mri thank you dr chintan
for a very nice presentation i think there are no more questions may we move to next speaker so next talk is on surgical management of septic hip and it will be delivered by dr raju ne gandhi dr raju please yeah so this is a typical presentation of a child who will present to you with a uh, septic arthritis of hip and a proximal femur osteomyelitis so this child is holding the leg in flexion adduction and internal rotation inability to move the affected limb that is pseudo paralysis uh, it may be associated with fever and refusal to accept the feeds so this is a common scenario where uh, by which the child is going to present to you and be aware that this child may be toxic also so uh, i'll just try to highlight about septic arthritis of hip in neonate and children so it's a intra articular infection in children that is considered a surgical emergency and requires prompt recognition and treatment hip joint is involved in 35% of cases of all septic arthritis and 50% of these cases occur in children younger than 2 years of age so uh, if we miss them the there are going to be large implications of uh, chronic osteomyelitis and sequelae of that so it is uh, recommended that we diagnose and treat it early so which are the at risk babies who are premature immunocompromised born with c sections and patients treated in nicus uh, root of infections are most common hematogenous sometimes it could be a direct inoculation or could be contagious spread but in cases of septic arthritis and most of the osteomyelitis in neonates and children it is a hematogenous in origin so what is the pathogenesis i think it is already been covered but i'll try to quickly uh, go through it so there is a uh, 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 bacterial deposit in the synovium producing inflammation and it will uh, spread in the synovial fluid and it will multiply and it will produce inflammatory uh, reaction which will destroy the joints in uh, in infants because the joint is more cartilaginous the damage is going to be more so the younger the child younger the neonate uh, the damage is going to be more if it is a uh, older child the vascularity of the joint is going to ha hamper and it can lead to vascular occlusion leading to necrosis of the epiphyseal bone so how do we diagnose as is been told by our previous speakers first and most important thing is clinical suspicion second important thing is again clinical suspicion and third important thing is again clinical suspicion so your clinical suspicion has to be very very strong and other diagnostic parameters like blood parameters and radiology are uh, to help confirm your diagnosis so x rays at initial stages it may not show anything in late presenting cases it might show uh, osteomyelitis or sequelae of that and by this time uh, we are already late to treat this and you can see sometimes joint joint destruction metaphyseal widening periosteal reactions ultrasound is the investigation of choice uh, where ultrasound has 100% sensitivity and about 95% specificity you will see fluid pus or septa uh you can see the ossific nucleus you can see the periosteal elevation and that will lead you to osteomyelitis associated with acute osteomyelitis sometimes you may see a uh, dislocation of hip because the amount of collection in the joint is so much that it will displace the uh, the femoral head or if the head is already dis uh, destructed it may dislocate the hip mri is again helpful uh, in cases where you have strong clinical suspicion but your ultrasound is not suggestive of osteomyelitis or septic arthritis the differential diagnosis will be osteomyelitis transient synovitis hemarthrosis jra 
uh, in some cases of scurvy and viral manifestations can also present with pseudo paralysis and inability to bear weight on the hip joint so you have to differentiate between uh, a transient synovitis a uh, septic arthritis and some adolescent conditions like uh, slip capital femoral epiphysis so uh, uh, this paper has been mentioned by uh, last two three speakers and here i would just like to elaborate this paper that uh, dr maninder kochar in his article from jbgs 2003 he uh, laid down some criteria as how we can diagnose a septic arthritis of the hip so first first criteria will be non weight bearing on affected side esr which is raised more than 40 this criteria is now recently re replaced with crp fever more than 100 and wbc count more than 12000 so according to coaches so if all these four criteria are present then your chances of infection are 99% if three of them are present then th then it is 93% if two are present then it is 40% if only one criteria is present still you are suspecting uh, osteomyelitis and septic arthritis in 12% of the cases this is most important that even these criteria are absent we are going to miss this 2% cases which are going to be undiagnosed untreated and we will have a sequelae of it so again most important thing will be a clinical suspicion whenever you have a suspicion like chintan said we can just try to aspirate the fluid and if the pus comes then we can proceed and to uh, orthotomy and make decisions further Ned in 1973 again laid down some criteria as how do we treat the osteomyelitis and septic arthritis. So he said antibiotics will be effective before pus formation. They will not sterilize a vascular tissue or abscesses, and such areas will require a surgical drainage. If such drainage is effective, antibiotics will prevent further formation of pus. surgery should not damage already ischemic bone and soft tissues antibiotic should be continued even after surgery so these are the criteria which he had laid down in 1973 and i think uh, it's now almost 50 years and they still uh, hold and uh, uh, we often use these criteria to treat a uh, child with osteomyelitis and septic arthritis so how do we manage them so a normal ultrasound again if the no ultrasound is normal uh, mri is normal then you have to do a bone scan then bone scan if it shows a hot spot again the clinical suspicion you have then you should go ahead and uh, try to aspirate the joint so early acute osteomyelitis intra we can start iv antibiotics if there is pus on ultrasound or M or on mri then only and if it is showing only joint involvement then aspiration followed by orthotomy if there is a periosteal elevation accompanied then you have to treat orthotomy and a metaphyseal window so how do we do it the capsulotomy and drainage of pus is done identify and lo locate articular cartilage wash is given with hydrogen betadine and saline a local antibiotic uh, you may or may not put that is controversial and we can close the uh, wound in layers so metaphyseal window in additional cases of osteomyelitis again to whether to immobilize or not to immobilize is depending upon the child and uh, most of the times if the hip is stable before the drainage uh, generally i do not immobilize but if you have already a dislocation Uh, then probably it is a good idea that you put a child in a pelvic harness or a spica cast so this is another child uh, you can see that the child is not able to move the left lower limb and you can see the fullness around the adductor region just quickly go through the surgical procedure incision is 1 cm below the asis Uh, you approach the hip joint 
through interval between sartorius and tensor fascial attack and below that you will encounter rectus femoris and once you uh, 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 release the rectus femoris from the aiis uh, so this is a interval between tfl and sartorius and you can see the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh retract the sartorius and tensor fascia lata and uh, isolation of rectus is done retract the rectus and once you open the joint just below that just below the rectus you can see the capsule and once you puncture the capsule you will see the pus coming out of it post operative protocol will be intravenous antibiotics for 3 to 6 weeks depending upon the uh, severity of the disease immobilization again like i said if the hip is dislocated then you will immobilize otherwise you may not immobilize a uh, weekly wbc and crp count to monitor the uh, prognosis of the child oral antibiotics for 2 to 3 weeks immunoglobulins in multiple joint involvement cases radiographs uh, taken 2 to 4 weeks so i think we have covered already so i'll just skip through these slides uh, you have to suspect dvt uh, in these cases also because uh, uh, it is sometimes Uh, pre, uh, the dvt is present along with septic arthritis so to conclude anterior approach is a safe and easy approach femoral head can be visualized during surgery synovial biopsies can be taken ultrasound is a very good tool for diagnosis septic arthritis is a surgical emergency in children because of virulent nature of organisms orthotomy and antibiotic treatment is the mainstay of the treatment Thank you very much. Thank you, Rajiv, for the excellent presentation. I have few questions. Uh, my first question is: What kind of drain do you keep? What uh, kind and how long do you keep the drain? Yeah, generally, uh, I do not keep a drain. you just mentioned it yeah. so in cases where you have osteomyelitis and septic arthritis that is the time when uh, i generally keep the drain otherwise only isolated septic arthritis i do not keep it yeah the second thing is uh, that you said you don't immobilize the hips especially the infants routinely yeah so why is that because the literature recommends and everybody's experience is that if you don't uh, immobilize these hips at least in a pauli harness they will definitely dislocate yeah. so what so is your uh, there was one paper i don't know which year but uh, they had a study uh, immobilizing and not immobilizing the child so yesterday also in our one of our uh, pediatric orthopedic group i had put that question and uh, people were of two opinions whether you should or you should not so uh, the recommendations that that paper has given that if you have a pre dislocation stage uh, before the surgery you should definitely immobilize but uh, it depends upon surgeon whether he would like to or he does not like i think most of the literature is in support of immobilizing okay. what is your personal experience i mean if you have not yeah. uh, uh, immobilized Haven't you encountered encountered dislocations later on? Yeah, in uh, my PG days or in Wadia days, where we did not had pelvic harness, also we used to make splints out of saline bottles. Uh, so that was my initial stage, and that was uh, the recommendations at that time. But probably nowadays, uh, in last few cases, I haven't used uh, any immobilization, and uh, I think it has worked for me. But yes. Uh, even this can dislocate uh there is a question in chat box uh is there a role of hip spica position for re dislocation in such a position of hip spica to prevent re dislocation maybe he is asking that yeah i think you will put a spica in uh, about uh, 30 to 40 degrees of abduction uh, around 10 to 15 degrees of flexion uh, and external rotation 
I have one one question to ask. You just mentioned you just do a puncture of the capsule and the pus comes out. Every time you do a puncture or you do a open yeah, so uh, capsule. Yeah, just puncture it. Then let everything come out and then again go ahead open it so that if there are any debris, you can just take it out. Any uh, precaution while taking uh, while doing the capsulotomy uh, regarding no. the incision and no, we are closure. Much, yeah, we are very much away from the neurovascular structure, so I don't think. Uh, so actually the recommendation is make a generous cut in the capsule generous not a small keyhole yeah, cut so initial make a, a puncture yeah. and then followed by yeah. so make a generous uh, uh, capsulotomy and drain everything out and close. don't don't close it don't, close, don't yeah. close it don't close the capsule but you can close the wound what is your uh, how uh, in how much concentration do you use the hydrogen peroxide because yeah. Some people are strongly against hydrogen peroxide and uh, some people are using in very much diluted form. Yes, what so is... we are using diluted form. Okay. Anyone who wants to ask question? Backside. Yeah, I don't use that. Recommend hydrogen peroxide. Neither do I recommend use of betadine. Just plain saline and lavage it thoroughly, just with saline. No. Uh, uh, no, not really. No. No. Only one question. Uh, what about bone scan? You mentioned in the diagnostic protocol so what is the current status of bone scan diagnosis yeah, so bone scan first thing is availability of the bone scan uh, so unless i mean if you are really suspecting osteomyelitis and uh, your mri is also negative then probably you will like to do bone scan i just put the bone scan just to complete the workup i think it has no role it has no role for that, that's why I'm telling you. Okay, I think there are uh, no more questions. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv, for a fantastic presentation. Yeah, uh, I would like to invite Amit. Uh, yeah. And uh, Dr. Amit Tagare is going to speak on management of septic shock. Uh, the intensive life is uh, a pendulum from prevention of shock to managing shock. So when anytime anybody asks, will you talk about shock? That is what happens. We are very happy. Uh, the last time I presented shock was in Sydney. So it's almost 10 years back. And then two days back, I asked Rajiv, who is the audience? And he said, so what is neonatal shock? A shock in any age group is state of decreased tissue level oxygenation because of circulatory disturbance and that leads to all the further things. It's a common indication of admission to level 3 NICU. Rather, most of the admissions that we get are because of shock. Independent predictor of neonatal mortality. So it's a very serious condition and there are so many criteria on admission to decide what will be the outcome. So etiology, as for any age group, hypovolemia may happen, but it's very rare. Cardiogenic shock is quite common. And what is today's interest is septic shock. But uh, see, shock is shock. So we manage it as shock. Etiology is treated separately. So I'll be talking only about shock. So septic shock is the systemic inflammatory uh, response syndrome. Now, the commonest reason of shock in our units now is post-COVID inflammatory syndrome. We'll go to stages of shock. Now, when we uh, we always see these uh, the traffic signals, and we always read it from above down. Here we read it from below up. The first stage is the compensated shock, where the body is trying to compensate tachycardia, uh, baby's irritability, whatever it is. You will see the flush baby, tachycardia, and all those things where the physiology of the baby is trying to compensate. This is the best time to intervene and refer the patient to intensive care unit. 
second is the uncompensated but reversible where you have a window of working where you can work try to uh, help the patient out and the patient might respond but the third stage is the red signal it's uncompensated irreversible shock most of the patients die during transfer or they just reach the nicu just for the sake of reaching there so uncompensated shock is irre uh, and in the irreversible stage is not the right time to refer so we need to have some clinical suspicion or sometimes the only the discomfort of the physician is enough for transferring the patient to icus now how do we define neonatal shock uh, i'll just tell you the things few things capillary refill time it's the easiest way of defining whenever you are you have a neonat or a pediatric uh, uh, the infant in the, your uh, surgical unit and if you see that when you press on the chest at the sternum and then count 1001 1002 1003 1002, if the color doesn't reappear back in those 3 seconds this patient is landing in shock urine output is good for other age groups but in neonates it is a difficult thing to manage because in first 2 3 days of life the urine output is low blood pressure the range of blood pressure varies in neonate but for an infant or a neonate who is beyond first week of life you have a good amount of uh, criteria for diagnosing shock or hypotension on blood pressure echocardiography functional echocardiography is a good way of diagnosing it and the svc flow is one what we see it should be maintained more than uh, 55 or in preterm babies more than 40 blood parameters if you see most of the patients on admission and on the follow up we do the abg with lactate because lactate is the indicator of cellular hypoxia and shock so if you have a high lactate that means this baby is getting decompensated and this is the time you intervene and keep monitoring the lactate which will give you some idea about the cellular perfusion non invasive methods the nirs that is the near infrared spectroscopy has realized in uh, time and now we have the monitors which give us nirs it's a good way of diagnosing shock hypotension i won't go in detail but uh, the thumb rule is if you have a 32 weeker then your mean blood pressure should be more than 32 so that is the way you can go for a uh, hypotension the only thing is you need to have a proper neonatal cuff for every age group or weight group because the small as the baby's weight changes the cuff size changes now what are the associations of hypotension <clears throat> lower the gestational age higher incidence of hypotension lower birth weight higher incidence of hypotension these are the very significant risk factors male gender mechanical ventilation changes the dynamics inadequate antenatal steroids in preterm babies poor myocardial contractility in the neonatal age group due to other reasons large pda pda is something that is unique for neonates and high snap to score which indicates the uh, sickness of the baby why hypotension is important it increases the risk of lower urine output and hyperkalemia which in uh, in itself uh, will affect the cardiac functioning periventricular and intraventricular hemorrhages poor long term neurodevelopment outcome which is very important and increase mortality now conditions to look for in hypotensive newborn is blood loss pneumothorax sepsis pda high intrathoracic pressure when the patient is ventilated and heart failure management of neonatal shock supportive management plays very important role elective pulmonary support is important you need to ventilate a patient sometimes when even then the saturation and heart rate is okay antibiotics even if the patient is not uh, septic we have to support them with antibiotics because in these patients uh, with shock they can land up with infection we have to maintain the metabolic milieu that is blood sugar uh, his uh, acidosis and electrolytes nutritional support is mandatory because these babies are very critical managing hemodynamics uh i won't go in this because it's very this one deep for any age group so management step what we do volume expansion a single bolus is advised beyond that we need to uh, get it with the eco done then we go to first line inotrope which may be dopamine or dobutamine depending on the patient dopamine in case of a shock septic shock and dobutamine in case if you are suspecting a cardiogenic shock 
noradrenaline sometimes used in life threatening hypotension and rescue therapy with corticosteroids volume expansion is the first intervention in all age groups but in neonet we usually limit it to one and beyond one bolus we go by a di- uh, eco balance and decide what to be do in the volume expansion hypovolemia is rare in neonates boluses have a risk of intraventricular hemorrhages and adverse neurological effects multiple boluses should be avoided and we usually don't use albumin catecholamines we have dopamine dobutamine epinephrine norepinephrine non catecholamine agents we have melrinone which is used mostly in septic shock or when uh, we have certain conditions like necrotizing enterocolitis methylene blue is rarely used steroids steroids are used when we have a catecholamine resistant shock or we have adrenal insufficiency because of uh, prematurity or other reasons we have re- reserved arsenal which has still remained reserved for last 10 years arginine vasopressin very toxic dopexamine usually not used and levosimandan is sometimes used in but it is quite rare so this is uh, the general guideline if you see the the first thing is to establish the airway abc is uh, the same thing check the breathing and then ventilate if necessary obtain iv access at least have one extra iv access because in shock you are very lucky to get an iv access if you lose that time then you have lost the iv access also draw the blood culture electrolytes blood gas calcium correct the hypoglycemia start antibiotics now if there is a history or if you feel that there is a hypovolemia then only go for a bolus and it's the saline bolus 10 ml per kilo if there is no history or suggestive factors of hypovolemia then we just give a single bolus and then if we have a central venous pressure monitoring then only we go ahead if the cvp is low we start dobutamine if there is a cardiogenic thing or dopamine if the patient is like septic shock then we increase the doses and then go to second inotrope if dobutamine used first then dopamine is second if dopamine used first then dobutamine is second we in meanwhile we send the cortisol levels or we uh, check the possibility of adrenal adrenocortical insufficiency and in that case we go for steroids epinephrine is a very rare thing to use which is used in a, a baby who is not responding to dopamine or dobutamine so it's very difficult to manage a neonatal shock so what we have today we need a like in preterm babies we need good antenatal corticosteroid many of the babies who have septic arthritis or osteomyelitis might be preterm so they need a, a good antenatal corticosteroid no intervention for hypotension without shock see hypotension doesn't mean shock in neonates manage the treatable causes of hypotension like pneumothorax or your ventilation has to be managed or if the sepsis is there then treat with antibiotics svc flow determination before intervention is necessary limit the fluid boluses and inotropes and milrinone may be uh, a role may have some role in certain situations so patience is the key we can do incredible things simply by uh, being committed to make them happen so if we keep our patience and keep on doing things in the right way a patient in shock can be revived thank you any thank you amit any questions uh, amit uh, i think we have learned in books that if you do not have a intravenous access go intraosseous so i mean i just wanted to ask you practical things about it i mean have you encountered any situation See, neonet uh, the best part is you have umbilical cord okay. so if you have a baby in first 7 8 days where the cord is still there then uh, the best it's the widest route available so uh, umbilical cord uh, you can have umbilical venous access that is the best part and nowadays we have so uh, well developed techniques of central line access that we usually don't need intraosseous uh, i've been doing it for last 20 years and i have not done a single intraosseous because the central lines and techniques of central lines are so good well established and in first week of life we have umbilical veins thank you amit i think we'll move on to the next talk uh, that is by dr anil agrawal okay.
Is the screen visible? Yes, sir. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I am assigned the topic septic six equally. So the learning points from this talk are the natural history of a septic heap and what interventions are possible in a sequelae heap. Basically, we have to understand that these key factors undermine any management. The, the articulation of the capital head to the acetabulum and the uh, and the communication of the head to the femoral shaft, and this determine the overall management in a septic sequel. We have many classifications. We are all aware of them. This is the most common classification which we use. I will not go into the details. And there is a Joris classification which has a predominant group 3A in which there is a capital epiphysis present, but it is either dislocated or subluxated. Later, Joey also said that the classification 4A is the same as 3A. So we go to first three groups which are stable. In these groups, the cephalomedullary communication is present and the containment is also present. So for these groups, you prefer doing a proximal femoral procedure or acetabular or augmentation like we do for DDH. The next comes the three unstable groups like group two in which there is no head, group three in which the head is subluxated and group five in which the head epiphysis is present but there is no communication with the shaft. So there is a cephalomedullary discontinuity. So first take, uh, let us take the first group which is 4A, Joy 4A or group three according to the Joris classification. I take up an example to explain the management. So this is a child which was drained at nine months. So this is the condition at nine months. The child also had concomitant septic arthritis elbow. And you can, as you can appreciate the left hip is dislocated. To see the epiphysis, we got an MRI. You can appreciate a small size epiphysis is present on this side. So what, what we did was we tried an open reduction in this case, but there was a gross mismatch between the acetabular head and the acetabulum cavity. So we have to put K wires initially to stabilize it and the spica was supplemented thereafter. This is six months post-operative. You can appreciate the acetabulum has started farming. This is two years follow up. One thing you might have missed while appreciating the left side is that the right side has now started dislocating. So why does this happen? Late dysplasias can have, so actually this was a case of septic elbow and both side hip involvement, but the right side was altogether missed and the late dysplasia can thus, you can see uh, lateralizing hip. So what we can learn from this case is that treatment can definitely alter the, the natural history and contribute to stable hip mechanics in many cases. And in all cases, and in some cases, the all the effects of septic arthritis are not visible on day one. They can manifest several years later. We move on to the next group in which there is cephalomedullary dissociation, which we commonly known as Choi type 3B. So let me give you a case. So this particular child was drained at 10 days. Okay, you can see the lateralization of the hip. At six months post osteomyelitis, you can see, uh, sorry, post drainage, you can appreciate the osteomyelitic changes visible in that. So it was a case of concomitant septic arthritis along with osteomyelitis. Hip. This is at one year. You can appreciate that epiphysis is associated, but there is a dissociation between the head part and the shaft part. At 4.5 years, you can see the epiphysis is developing, but there is onset of virus. So we decided to intervene at this stage. What we did was a valgus osteotomy. We added some bone graft and used a simpler implant and put the all the procedure, put the surgical procedure in a spica. To make more, the procedure can be more appreciated better in a two month post-operative exercise. You can see two fibular stars, a valgus osteotomy, additional bone graft. And a simple K-wire because the medial cortex was kept intact. So simple fixation method could work. So this is six months and we have a seven year follow up for this child. Okay. The child just came after the COVID period. You can see a enlarged epiphysis a contained acetabula. There was some shortening. This is the child. 
how it can squat and sit cross leg and this is how he walks so you can appreciate the lurch but function is reasonably well so what's the take home message as already pointed out by other speakers their concomitant septic arthritis and osteomyelitis is very common and dissociated physis can be viable it can continue to grow despite dissociation from the shaft and fixation even through transfixation by fibular graft we take up the last case which is considered the most difficult of all the situation that is the choi four type b there is no head or neck in this particular case so to give you an example this is a 7 year old child presenting with a significant lurch and shortening 7 cm and this is the radiograph of this particular child you can appreciate there is no head or neck the acetabulum is totally shallow and the trochanter is high right so what we did was a the classical procedure this type for this the pelvic support osteotomy and this is how we do it there can be many methods to do it but this is one of the methods i am depicting so you stabilize the proximal osteotomy with a bent plate and the distal osteotomy and the lengthening is performed by external fixator to compensate for the limb length discrepancy we put an additional contralateral eight to eight plates on the opposite femur distal femur so these are the sequential x ray showing the post operative 3 months 5 months i quickly take you through the complete series 7 months 14 months 20 months 27 months this child came for regular follow up so we have a complete follow up for this child and this is the slide i wanted to show you at end of 5 years you can appreciate that the medialization has remodeled the medullary cavity has reformed but you can appreciate that the knee are at the same level so limb length equalization has been achieved now and this is the child as he walks you totally not abolish the tender bar lurch but the child is much better of walking so the talk on uh, take home message is that when you do such procedures you must keep the child in regular follow up and if there is a significant remodeling and the lurch redevelops you may i require additional procedures thank you thank you very much sir for the excellent cases any questions uh, sir i have one uh, query what is the youngest age that you do Uh, PSO, pelvic support osteotomy. There are two opinions regarding this. I am aware of the two controversies. If you do early, at seven years of age, there will be a significant remodeling by the time by the child by the time the child reaches fourteen years. But the pros are that the child has developed a choi four a at the age of one month. So if you leave the child further till fourteen years without intervention, just by sure age. He has passed almost fourteen years of his life or her life with a significant lurch, and the secondary changes of knee and spine will will by then occur and make the child miserable, make the life miserable for the child. So my preference would be to intervene early, even if it is required to do a repeat PSO at the age fourteen years. It will give him give him or her length and some stability of the hip for at least five years. till he or she you might not require a repeat procedure at 14 years okay agreed fair enough good sir uh, any experience of doing uh, colona procedure or capsular interposition for choi type 4 sir personally my feeling is these are of historical importance and they are asked in pg course that's the only significance they have if you have a examiner if they you if you have an examiner and you are a post graduate you must know about the procedure but practically only pso works the these do not work and they are these are limited to very specialized hands i think in recent literature is showing that the colona procedure is coming back and um, some there of the are no papers there are no papers there was one only one paper from a chinese series after that nobody has described lp or colona procedure i think sir there is a paper by gans Uh, where he has described the in capsular interposition procedure for all these uh, septic hip sequelae so and uh, and sir. hip uh, maybe for... there are there are procedures which work in specialized hand but these are the standard teachings which i have shown you yes sir i completely agree how uh, late or how early you do a mri 
after the uh, i mean the acute phase is over when you decide to reconstruct so if uh, this is this is a 3 month old child whom we had treated and it's a dislocated hip which we can clinically see so what is the time when you would like to intervene and then start making decisions for future first thing you must ensure that the infection has settled okay so the management of acute dislocation post septic has to be at the time of arthrotomy itself usually i protect the if there is a hip dislocation or i find the hip dislocatable at the time of arth arthrotomy i usually protect the child in a hip spica for 6 weeks okay so my intervention bones for a 3a type i won't label it 3a unless at least one year post septic sequelae and my intervention don't start so early because there is some residua inflammation present even at 3 months so you don't want to put do a procedure in a in a loose or soft cartilage and lose the head again you must let the things settle down before you decide to intervene again so my typical age would, for intervention would be at 1 year or beyond that and at that time i would like to obtain mri okay yeah so i think uh, any questions from faculty ashish or nirmal i i think then we'll move on uh, sir can i just request you for your second talk also so that we can just fi finish it in uh, okay just a minute so uh, next talk is on tuberculosis hip in children thank you for taking my talks in continuation this is tb hip in children and this is a very basic talk so we will cover introduction clinical features radiological features and management first although tb hip is considered uncommon it is just common after spinal tuber tuberculosis for those who are not aware it can start both in the synovium as well or as well as it has osseous focus naming head trochanter or the isthmus region another special thing about it is that the pus can track anywhere down up medially and then it can present at various places to give you example this particular child had a swelling in the gluteal region and when we investigated the child she had this picture which later came out to be tuberculosis so tb can have many different presentations and different sites of pus collection now we go for the clinical features the hip region is richly supplied by the nerves and as you can appreciate there are many nerves in this region and the pain from tuberculosis hip can be referred to any one of these nerves the child can present with night cries as well the most typical sign which we find in an active disease is antalgic gait tenderness in the femoral region severe muscle spasm limb length discrepancy may be present and the typical posture of faber flexion abduction external rotation in fact there is a whole classification based on this which has synovitis early arthritis advanced arthritis and the later complications start developing and as you move as you notice in the right column there is decrease in the progressive decrease in the range of motions and radiological deterioration is there so let me take up first take up the synovitis stage it is a irritable hip you will typically find a fever position and there will be rare flexion of the acetabul uh, sorry head as you can appreciate in this particular x rays of a 4 year child when you do a mri in this case it is no no different from septic arthritis transiosynovitis or any other irritable hip condition which you have for this age group so you have a long leap for differential diagnosis at this particular age not go into the details then we come to the early arthritis stage what will further happen is that your position changes as the joint space decreases your attitude changes and you have erosions developing now so what will the radiological picture look like the margins become blurred the articular erosion is obvious advanced arthritis more further destruction and this time shortening as well 
So in this particular case, you can see that the joint space has practically disappeared. And in this particular case, tubercular osteomyelitis was also associated. Now, we come to the complications of tubercular arthritis. There are several descriptions available. Wandering, broken shunton line, subluxation, proteusio, and motor and passel. What does exactly these terms mean? So in a wandering acetabulum, the lower part of the acetabulum is empty. Dislocations, we are all are obvious or aware. What is potusio? When the head moves more medially, and if you draw a line joining this iliopibial line to the obturator foramen, the head is lying beyond that. This is potusio. What about motor and person? The head size is much smaller than the acetabular size. Sometimes these entities are intermixed and may coexist with each other. The tips. Certain tips, in except for the stage 1 synovitis stage, in stage 2, 3 and 4, the typical posture is flexion reduction internal rotation. When you can have fiber in this position, when the child has been in position, this particular position in the bed or there is a destruction of Y ligament. This I am telling you because this is a frequently asked question in postgraduate examination. Now for the radiological features, we all are aware of this classification Shangma Sundaram and there are seven types. We have already discussed the earlier types. I would like to discuss two special types. One is the Parthai type which is particularly present in the children and the atropic type which is present in the adult because the article cartilage because there is no grow epiphysis in this particular age group. So this is what Parthis type will look like. You can appreciate a very typical present and the diagnosis is obvious only on the biopsy. You can't distinguish between these two on a radiograph. There can be other radiological present as well, such as Coxa Magna, Breva, Vera, Vera and Velga. And as all classifications do, as you move from normal to more complex type, your outcomes will worsen and you will have a poor prognosis. How to manage this case? Now, this is the most important part which I love to talk about. We live in a country where TB is endemic and you have to suspect TB for every infection. So if your clinical findings suspect TB, then you should put effort to prove it otherwise. Okay. So how do we diagnose TB? We have imaging, laboratory, clinical, radiological basis. Imaging, first of all, imaging. Nothing is specific about tubercular imaging except for osteopenia and all these findings in plain radiograph, ultrasound, CT scan can be found in other infections as well. However, imaging help us to locate the site of infection, skip lesions and obtain a guided biopsy. Hematological, again very non-specific, but ESR can be used to monitor the course of the disease when antitubercular treatment has been started. We do not use IgM or IgG as they are considered non-specific now. Now, what is the problem? Why we do miss TB? This is what we commonly do. When we take a sample, we just send it for pus, aerobic and tissue for histopath. And we just obtain two samples. What should we actually do? I know this is something difficult, but please obtain multiple tissues and send them for all possible tests because Bacteria do not lie in the pus, they love to lie in the vascular tissue and especially tubercular uh, bacilli doesn't like to live in a pus uh, which is dead tissue. So try to obtain tissues from the edge and send them for this because each have a very less sensitivity in tuberculosis. What are the media available or what are the tests available to us? So we have the LG culture, we have MIJT, we have histopath and as you can appreciate, the sensitivity for them is limited or not every test is gold standard. And recently, G molecular analysis in the form of expert is coming in a big way because it is reported to have a high specificity and high sensitivity. So if you have facilities available, please do send your sample for this. Now we have often learned this very very peculiar statement from our textbook. 
in developing countries in general the diagnosis of tuberculosis of bone and joints can be reliably made on clinical and radiological examination and that's why we refrain from taking biopsies and start to tuber anti tubercular treatment over empirical basis so don't misuse this statement try to always try to obtain sample because there are many diagnoses which mimic tuberculosis and sometimes even fnc or true cut biopsy will suffice so this is how what was the earlier aim in historical how do we used to treat tuberculosis hip the aim was to obtain a fused joint but the same does not uh, hold true now after the invent of multi duct chemotherapy we try to repose the joint in best function position and start early exercises we must remember the adjuvant treatment like analgesic nutritional therapy because these children are also malnourished take care of the splintage and we have specific indication for surgery the main indication being to obtain the tissue decompress bulky abscesses and deal the complication later the surgery has a role in deformity correction and providing a mobile joint if it, if that is possible or a stable joint as you can see as we go down the ladder the expected outcome and the range of mobility which is expected we can only predict the range of motion till the early arthritis stage after that it is very difficult to predict the what will be the outcome i'll take quickly run through a few cases this is the synovitis case you can have just osteopenia at this stage and what will happen when you give anti tubercular treatment you can hopefully get a spherical head and a mobile joint this is the earlier arthritic case the erosions have set in still if you start anticular tu tubercular treatment timely you can hope to get a normal joint but coxa magna and such changes subtle changes will present and this is the function with the child might have when you deal with complications or advanced arthritis this was a particular child discharging sinus was present and the migratory acetabulum was is seen we tried to open it restore the joint and this is the head which is looks like intraoperatively i tried to stabilize with k wires but in the end that joint ankylosed and you have a fixed flexion deformity whatever you do the infection settled but this is the fixed flexion deformity with the child had advanced ar arthritis case this i al already have shown you what happened in this case the head resolved and paradoxically you had a good range of motion but the hip was unstable subluxated hip we tried to reduce it but the head did not budge and ankylosed ankylos in the same position and when such things happen then you have to do a extra articular osteotomy to correct the deformity so the summary is that prognosis is better when you detect that this is early and start the treatment early and good treatment good outcome can be expected only during the synovial or low grade arthritis stage thank you yeah thank you very much sir uh, i think uh, it's little late now it's we are almost at 10:30 so we'll skip the questions for uh, tb hip and we'll move on to the next lecture by uh, uh, ruta madam on sequelae on osteomyelitis so i am going to talk about sequelae of acute osteomyelitis basically i am going to talk about these four sequelae pathological fracture gap non unions and deformities so the principles of treatment are thorough debridement and bold resection bold resection of all the dead bone and uh, granulation tissue infected tissue insertion of antibiotic impregnated cement beads or sometimes even intramedullary rod nowadays we prefer to use calcium sulfate beads then fixation of pathological fracture early coverage of the wound and use of vac whenever necessary so antibiotic impregnated cement beads need to be removed so nowadays we prefer to use calcium sulfate beads which are completely absorbable coming to the pathological fracture the bone breaks because it is weakened either due to a big cavity 
or there is sclerosis or even sometimes there is osteopenia due to infection so again the principles are same debride it use beads and fix the fracture so this is an example of pathological fracture due to big cavity you can see a big cavity at the distal end of uh, radius so i debrided the cavity removed the sequestrum and filled it with calcium sulfate the beauty of this calcium sulfate is that you can completely close the skin in first place and i just give a cast to this child and it united very well with complete cure of infection but every time you cannot be as lucky as that for example this girl had acute osteomyelitis and she came to me 6 months after you can see there is a lot of sclerosis there are multiple sequestrae she came to me with a draining sinus so she was actually treated in a hip spica which failed so i did a thorough debridement removed all the sequestrae i freshened the bone ends and applied elizero fixator to her and started immediate weight bearing and it united nicely this is a 3 year follow up you can see complete union with complete cure of infection this boy had pan diaphyseal osteomyelitis and a segmental fracture so uh, he was again uh, treated with debridement and uh, was given a posterior slab this part of the fracture uh, bone was exposed this bone was exposed and uh, somebody drilled holes in the bone so he came uh, about 6 weeks after this pathological fractures to me i did a thorough debridement i removed that dead bone and uh, applied elizero fixator his fibula was united so i did bone transport what i did was i distracted the proximal fracture and transported the bone so you can see the bone is forming the regenerate is visible in the proximal fracture and both the fractures united so even if it was a pathological fracture it just united with distraction coming to the gap gaps can result due to removal of huge sequestrae or even resection of bone so there are different ways to treat gaps of course bone transport is my choice of treatment but vascularized fibular graft tbr pro fibula or what is called as huntington's and of course non vascularized free fibular graft vascularized fibular graft requires an expert plastic surgeon because finding a pedicle in a pediatric leg is sometimes very difficult and there are high refracture rates and chances of vessel thrombosis also tibia profibula pro huntington's as it is known it's a technically easier surgery but it can cause later defor deformation and be uh, it can have delayed healing at one site also coming to non vascularized fibular graft it's a popular procedure the prerequisites are there should be no discharge for at least 6 months no signs of infection hematologically and radiologically and clinically for at least 6 months before you uh, do this procedure so this is a case by sandeep patwardhan uh you can see uh, he has uh, done this uh, prefibular graft in this case so first thing that we have to do is prepare the bed and make drill holes and open the medullary cavity if it is closed then opposite fibula is harvested uh, we have to remove uh, extra periosteal fibula of the exact size that you require then you drill a retrograde wire in the distal fragment and pass a wire through the fibula and the same wire is in is then driven in the proximal fragment so the fibula is seated nicely in the gap like that so uh, then you cut the wire and bend it so this is the wire in the fibula and tibia so he had acute osteomyelitis uh, previously then a uh, huge sequestrum was removed then uh, then the uh, tibia was distracted initially to recreate the gap properly then this prefibular transfer was done and you can see a good union there and that's the follow up so it's a good procedure even i have done quite a few of these 
but there are some problems like there are chances of reinfection delayed union is pretty common with this and of course persistent of limb length discrepancy so my choice of treatment is bone transport for gap because not only bone uh, gap is uh, filled but you can even close soft tissue gaps and of course you can correct limb length discrepancy so this is a case of uh, acute osteomyelitis you can see big sequestrae there so after removal of sequestrae you can see there is gap why this is not moving okay so uh, i did a distal corticotomy and a bone transport from below upwards and you can see good union there good regeneration there was a little recurvatum deformity but it remodeled in no time another huge gap because of removal of large sequestrum so even in this child you can see the fibula is intact so i did a bone transport i did a proximal corticotomy and did about 8 cm of bone transport and you can see a fantastic union there with complete cure of infection this girl had acute osteomyelitis sequestrum was removed she also had destruction of growth plate on medial and anterior side so she came to me one and half years after acute osteomyelitis with shortening and varus and recurvatum deformity there is fibular overgrowth also and fibula also has varus so i removed a chunk of fibula i freshened the bone ends and corrected the deformity acutely i ablated the remaining growth plate applied elizero fixator and did a corticotomy distally and a lengthening there and she united very nicely so as expected because her growth plate was completely damaged she came back at the age of 16 with 4 cm of shortening then i did uh, lengthening in her with the technique which i have developed and published called as lengthening over slotted plate so you can see 4 cm of lengthening and nice regenerate there coming to infected non union infected non union can result because of inadequate treatment of pathological fracture that's the mo uh, most common cause so the treatment principles are again the same debride if there is infection correct if there is deformity so this boy came to me like the like that after one year of his acute osteomyelitis episode uh, he was treated elsewhere by debridement and he was given a cast so the child continued to walk on the cast and you can see his beads are protruding out from the skin and he came to me with such severe deformity almost 90 degrees of recurvatum and about 50 to 60 degrees of varus so this was a stiff non union so all i did was i debrided and applied elizero fixator and corrected the deformity gradually so just by correcting the deformity the fracture united the non union united and that's the final result so out of 90 degrees just 10 degrees recurvatum remained because the uh, non union united before i could correct the last 10 degrees but since he was a young child and distal growth plate was intact i knew that this would remodel very fast so this is his two year follow up as expected the deformity remodel and he has full function coming to deformities the deformities secondary to osteomyelitis can uh, can be due to mal unions or due to partial growth arrest so this child has this deformity you can see there is a flexion deformity of the knee actually the deformity is not in the knee it's in the distal end of femur as you can see there is a huge sclerotic fragment so this osteomyelitis united in a uh, severe mal position so what i did i removed the entire sclerotic fragment and corrected the deformity acutely and applied elizero fixator i compressed it and then later on i distracted it to gain length so you can see his knee is completely straight and he gained 3 cm of length but he was still short by 4 cm so i lengthened his tibia for his femoral shortening because his femur was not really good so i could lengthen only 3 cm again i used this technique of lengthening over slotted plate and you can see excellent regeneration there this is his femur and that's him 
and that's his full function so thank you for your kind attention so we celebrated women's day in uh, this month on 8th so i really feel proud to display this photo so we are six female orthopedic surgeons here uh, we were working at one point of time in our institute so i really uh, feel good to display this photo uh, i want to take uh, this opportunity to announce uh, do you want to take a photo of this yes, please please do <laughs> thank you so uh, we are having uh, asami con uh, 22 in uh, pune the venue is sheraton grand and the dates are 17th 18th and 19th of june so i invite all of you for this grand academic event so the theme is recent advances and innovations in elizaro methodology because so many new things are happening uh, in uh, elizaro methodology so this is our theme and we are going to have two workshops one basic workshop and another is on six axis uh, fixator the smart fixator called as deft fix and it is also useful for correcting pediatric deformities so two simultaneous uh, workshops will be there and uh, there will be interactive session with the maestro dr dror pele he will talk about the recent advances and innovations in limb lengthening including his uh, self lengthening plate we will be having uh, debates which is, which are fun to uh, uh, learn and many other sessions so uh, you can have more uh, details of this conference and registration details on our website assamindia.com i request you to please visit it thank you for your kind attention thank you thank you dr rutta for wonderful presentation of difficult cases and their management now we are move on to the last lecture by dr ashish ranade uh, and he is going to discuss the cases uh, unfortunately because of the time time constraint he is going to restrict himself for few minutes and i request uh, dr ashish ranade to share his screen please i'll be quick um, i'm just going to present one case and talk about this so this 3 year old girl fever refusing to walk Uh, raised white cell count high crp high esr uhg showing some effusion so the question is by going cocker criteria is it septic arthritis should we do arthrotomy and wash out but um, some of our clinical examination was equivocal there was the hip movements were not that pain free not painful and some hip movements were possible so we thought this is not septic arthritis at that point we did a bone scan which was available and it showed increased uptake in the left ilium so we did mri which showed osteomyelitis of the iliac wing and there was collection over there so that was drained uh, it grew mssa and it was treated with uh, debridement and antibiotics so that brings us to the question is it always septic hip because cocker's criteria they were described in 2002 and over 20 years the understanding has changed the the whole spectrum of septic hip or musculoskeletal infections has resolved so this paper looked at the various presenting conditions which are like septic hip you will see that 32% one third cases it was pericapsular pyomyositis it was osteomyelitis in about 6% of cases and yes septic hip was there in 15% so another study they validated an algorithm to predict adjacent musculoskeletal infection because the problem is if we do arthrotomy and there is no pus then what what do we do how do we go next so there is a role for mri to identify these conditions early and treat them appropriately so if the patient is older if the patient symptoms are present for more than 3 days if the crp is on the higher side and uh, absolute neutrophil count is on the higher side if of those four uh, three are present then there is a higher risk of 
septic arthritis with adjacent infection and mri should be ordered so that's that's the point i mean consider doing early mri because that will clinch the diagnosis of these pericatrular pyomyositis arthritis and you can intervene at the right time and uh, treat that patient in the best possible way thank you thank you ashish for the case i just wanted to ask you what what did you do for the uh, iliac wing osteomyelitis did you make any drill holes or uh, how did you go about it ashish please unmute yourself yeah so that was treated with uh, i didn't do any uh, holes in the iliac wing i did abscess drainage and that's it kept a drain and gave antibiotics as per the culture report okay so uh, the uh, iliac uh, uh, wing is a place where you can get a recurrent uh, infection or uh, i mean it you can get sometimes a inadequate drainage also so uh, i mean have you encountered yes 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 but not in this case uh, we didn't encounter any recurrence the child made uneventful recovery and there was no chronic osteomyelitis i had a case recently who had a simultaneous pneumothorax also along with uh, osteomyelitis of uh, iliac wing and that uh -huh. we had to reopen and we had to put a drain in the chest and i mean he was going to more towards septicemia and then we had to monitor him ultimately he did well but uh, we had he had a long journey thank you so i would like to thank all the faculties who have come here and uh, uh, yeah and uh, i would like to hand over the mic to our secretary on behalf of sangli district orthopedic association uh, i dr karnalkar uh, and dr nitin patil uh thank you all the speakers thank you thank you all the speakers for their excellent talk and sparing their valuable time for this uh, clinical meeting i thank all the speakers i thank dr nirmal raj for uh, he gave a nice overview of clinical presentation of septic arthritis and osteomyelitis in children we could solve the dilemma of diagnosing uh, septic uh, sepsis in uh, borderline cases i thank dr tanmi singhal for giving clarity in the use of antibiotics in this condition i thank dr chintan doshi he nicely elaborated the surgical management of septic arthritis he stressed importance of thorough wash and biopsy in every case uh, i thank dr rajiv gandhi for his excellent talk on septic arthritis in hip he again stressed upon to be highly suspicious about this condition we should go for bone scan if ultrasound and mri are normal i thank dr anil tagare uh, we came out of shock smoothly by his uh, very brief talk on a shock <laughs> septic shock i thank dr anil agarwal sir for he Uh, showed his he shared his rich experience in managing sequelae of septic arthritis of hip and tuberculosis i thank dr rutha kulkarni for simplifying management of difficult issues in sequelae of osteomyelitis i thank you ashish ranade for his a nice case a clinical case for uh, uh, lastly he discussed with us i thank you uh, uh, dr mr ghatge for his uh, nice uh, arrangement of audio visual uh, uh, thing aspect of this clinical meeting i thank uh, magnet club uh, from uh, uh, mankind pharma for their generous uh, uh, sponsorship for this clinical meeting and i we offer a plant uh, to dr Rajuni Gandhi as a token of appreciation
uh, we also offering plant to dr uta kulkarni as a token of appreciation yeah on behalf of sdoa we present a plant uh, as a token of appreciation to dr amit tagare now i uh, now this uh, magnet uh, club from uh, mankind want to uh, present bouquet to our president dr nitin patil yeah yeah they also want to present me uh, uh, as a the secretary Yeah, I now declare this meeting is over. Thank you and good night. Yeah. yeah now uh, you are requested to enjoy a delicious dinner and a cocktail if you wish. Thank you. All faculties can have dinner at their home. Those who have come online. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Nirmal. Thank you, Anil Agrawal sir. Thank you, Ashish, uh, for being here so late. We hope to see you again very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.